We're continuing our journey through Lagrange's equations. So I'm just repeating here what we what we saw last time. We ended with, which is, uh, if you remember the steps, we started with Newton's laws for a system of particles that have some constraints on them, like they can slide on surfaces or there's rigidity constraints or something else. Then we projected Newton's laws into directions in which motion was possible. So the unconstrained directions that gave us, uh, that was what we call D'Alembert's principle. And that's a legitimate way to get equations of motion. Uh, then we took the D'Alembert principle with these, there's these dot products with these projection vectors. And we rewrote that in a form where the inertial stuff, the stuff related to accelerations could be written in terms of kinetic energy. So that's what this, you know, this left-hand side of this equation is. And the stuff related to active forces, not forces of constraint, so no reaction forces, just active forces becomes this capital Q. So we've, we've now got this system of equations for the little Qs, the generalized coordinates that describe the configuration of our system. And there's no constraints on them. And we've got this thing that we call Lagrange's equations. Um, we're going to talk about another form of Lagrange's equations today. So I'm going to call this Lagrange's equations in the generalized force form. And this is for a system of particles. So it's this thing here, which will end up giving you second order ODEs for the little Qs. And we've got a generalized force, which is this capital Q. It's the generalized force. You could think of it in the little qi direction, but directions kind of don't have meaning any, anymore. And then we've got these projection vectors, which um, are important because they, they tell us what directions the forces act in. And then T here, T is the total kinetic energy of the system. And it's going to be some function of all of the Qs and the Q dots. And if you take appropriate derivatives, then this left-hand side will give you the correct form for the accelerations and everything that comes from uh, inertial effects. So this is where we are. And this is, this is you could use this. Uh, we're going to look at a couple of additions to it, modifications. One is um, there's a way to write this capital QI in terms of forces that are conservative, so come from a potential energy, and then including uh, rigid body stuff. This is just for particles, but when we have rigid bodies, there'll be some something else that shows up. So let's start with the first generalization, which is that we can we can decompose. The, the applied forces into forces that come from, let's say the conservative forces, forces that are conservative, and then NC forces that are not conservative. So this means we've got, this is the applied force on particle J, and it equals a, it's a conservative part. That means it's due to forces that uh, come from a potential energy. Potential energy. And then we've got ones that don't come from a potential energy. So we just call them non-conservative. It's kind of misleading, a non-conservative force uh, just means it's a force that we don't know if it comes from a potential energy or not, or maybe we know that it doesn't. So it's just all of the others. So this could be a friction or a control force, like on a cart on in a pendulum. If we're doing some force that pulls the cart, well, we don't know if that force comes from a potential energy. So we just treat it like a non-conservative force. Um, so. Anything that's unknown gets lumped into the non-conservative. 
<clears throat> so uh, if we can do that, then this means we've got a potential energy. We're talking about the total potential energy. It's the total potential energy for a system, not for an individual particle, but for the system. So this will be a function of, if you think of it in the usual you know, physical space, it'll be a function of the positions, the vector positions of the n bodies. And since we can write the position of each particle in terms of the Qs, this also can be written as the uh, potential energy as a function of the little n generalized coordinates. And the conservative force acting on particle J, you've probably seen this before, it's the negative of the gradient of the potential energy function. And we need to emphasize, well, what does this gradient mean? This means it's a gradient with respect to the RJ vector. So the, an, another way to write this would be the negative um, partial derivative of this potential energy function U with respect to RJ. And that gives you a vector. So you kind of see maybe two things here. Up here, we've got sort of the world of the spatial, the spatial coordinates. And then here we'll be dealing with um, generalized coordinates. So the generalized force, QI, that comes from um, the active force on the particle. So we're just rewriting what we have up above. We take the, this would be the sum, right, of all of the particles. J goes from one to capital N. Applied force dotted with Ji. We now decompose, uh, I mean, Ja. We now decompose that applied force into the conservative and non-conservative parts. So this becomes um, the way that we've written it, right? Fj is some negative potential energy. So negative potential energy gradient dotted with, and let's just write out what Ji is, partial Rj, partial Qi. That's the conservative part. And then we've got sum over the particles, the non-conservative force on particle J dotted with gamma Ji. <clears throat> the reason I wrote out what gamma Ji is right here is that this helps us to see that this summation here <clears throat> It's just as if we uh, we have the chain rule applied to negative partial u partial q i. So that's a big simplification. We've got u as a function of the q's. We can write that, and so this is the negative uh, partial derivative of u with respect to q i. So this is what the conservative part will look like as a generalized force. And we can't uh, simplify any further the non-conservative part. So we just say this is QI and then a superscript NC to remind us that's the non-conservative. So this is the non-conservative generalized force. So that means taking the Lagrange equations in the generalized force form from up above, which looked like this. 
Now that we've decomposed the generalized force into conservative and a non-conservative part, we can re we can write this as negative partial u partial qi, and then just include that we've got this non-conservative part. All right, we'll we'll rewrite this even further. I'm going to move this uh, part with the potential energy over to the left-hand side. We've got D by DT, partial T, partial QI dot uh, minus, and I'll write this as partial T, partial QI uh, minus partial U, partial QI equals QI and C. And since U depends on just the Qs and not their derivatives, then partial U partial QI dot is equal to zero. So that means we can include over here sort of some you know, partial U or minus, just subtract it minus partial u partial qi dot. It's just like we're adding zero. But then this allows us to define something we call the Lagrange function or Lagrangian. Which is it's named, it's L named after Lagrange and it's kinetic total kinetic energy for the system minus total potential energy for the system. And written that way, then Lagrange's equations can be written as the total derivative of partial L partial QI dot minus partial L partial QI equals the uh, generalized force. And remember, this is for all of the, uh, you know, I runs from one through N, little n, the number of generalized coordinates. So now this, this we might call this um, Lagrange's equation, equations in the standard form. where you've got this thing called L and all of the all of the inertial forces and conservative forces can be written in this kind of interesting way of this combination of derivatives and then all of the all the non-conservative forces so everything that's left written here Okay, so it's got the same physical content as that first way of writing the Grandes equations. It's just now, um, it often gives some simplification because you can write the, you already have to write the total kinetic energy to use the Grandes equations. Now you just subtract off the total potential energy. You get this thing called L. It's a little bit unsatisfying that it's not kinetic plus potential energy but it is what it is. So. so let's try it out on some things that we can get by other means, but of course that's how we practice. So let's try an example. Um, let me find a figure of it. This looks good, do that. So this is the spring, this is a spring mass system. We've got a spring, we've got a mass. We also have a damper. So this is just one degree of freedom and we'll use a, right, this X, which is the, 
the deviation from equilibrium. So using the procedure above, we can, uh, you know, we'll say this, the mass has mass M. So we'll write the kinetic energy. The total kinetic energy for the system is just because it only moves in that one degree of freedom, be one half M X dot squared. So X is our generalized coordinate, right? Um, what about potential energy? Well, what are the forces on this? There's a force due to the damper and there's a force due to the spring. The force due to the spring, we could write as coming from uh, a spring potential energy, which hopefully you know is one half uh, the spring constant K and then the displacement from equilibrium squared. So one half K squared, all right. So our one generalized coordinate is X. Um, what's the Lagrangian? It's just T minus U. The minus sign throws everybody off because there's, there's not only that minus sign, but then there's a minus sign up here in the Lagrange's equation. So, you know, be mindful of the minuses. So this is one half M X dot squared minus one half K X squared. All right, we've got our Lagrangian. Uh, what about the, uh, so we're gonna have to take certain derivatives of that. I guess we could just do that. So partial L partial X dot, partial X dot is M X dot. Take the total derivative of that. It's M X double dot, right? X is our only variable. Mass doesn't change, mass is not a variable. Uh, what about partial L, partial X? This is gonna give us negative K X. Okay. We do have a non-conservative force, the force due to the damper here. So this, this force due to the damper, force, um, we only have one particle, so the non-conservative force is negative uh, C X dot, right? It's just this resistive um, linear damper. So the generalized coordinate, we only have one particle, so there's no summation, FNC dotted with partial R, partial X, what is R? R is, uh, I mean, there's only one direction in which things can move. We'll call that N1. So R is X, N1. So partial R, partial X is just the N1 direction. Yeah, I didn't put a force direction on here, but this should be N1. Take the dot product, they're in the same direction, N1 dotted with N1. So this is negative C, X dot N1 dotted with N1. So you get negative C X dot. We've got everything we need to now plug into Lagrange's equation for our one generalized coordinate. D by DT, partial L, partial X dot minus partial L, partial X equals Q one and C. Plug in everything. We have M X double dot minus of a minus. So this is plus K X equals minus C X dot. And that's the form of a spring mass damper. So this is, this is correct. You could verify it by using Newton's laws, but okay, so it seems to work. Seems to work. Let's try a two degree of freedom system. And I'll use one that we've already looked at. The, uh, the cart. A cart that moves horizontally with a pendulum. 
will it work here? So here's another example. It's the same card pendulum that we worked on last time. So this has two degrees of freedom. We, right, Q1 is this X displacement horizontally of the cart. Q2 is theta, the angle that the pendulum bob makes. And we already have the kinetic energy from last time. So we have T from last time. Um, but now any force that is due to potential energy, we want to include that. So the force of gravity on the pendulum bob, that is due to a potential energy. So that would be, we could pick some reference height. So I think the height of the middle of the cart, and then you include this, um, what's the height of the pendulum bob? Well, this is negative L cosine theta. So if we do M, that's the mass of the pendulum bob, G times its height with respect to some reference, this is uh, negative MGL cosine theta. So we have, we can construct L as T minus U, our Lagrangian function. Um, we'll still have, we've got this control force. And since we don't know what kind of force it is, we just lump it into the non-conservative forces. So we do have a non-conservative force, right? On, the cart, particle one, which will be FT in the, let's call this the N1 direction, right? N1. So then that will become a non-conservative uh, generalized force. So we'll also have some kind of non-conservative generalized forces. And Lagrange's equations, we're not gonna work them all out, but you could do it and you could see if this, this works out. And it will, it gives the same thing as before, if you work it out. It gives the same equations of motion. previous methods, but it's good to compare and contrast. Maybe you've already decided there's one that you like more than others, I don't know. Okay, so we've, if you have forces that come from a potential energy, otherwise known as conservative forces, then you can include those as um, into this Lagrangian function. And then this is Lagrange's equations. You should and will memorize Lagrange's equations because you're gonna use it. Now we've been talking about particles. What if we have a system of rigid bodies? It's, it, it's straightforward to incorporate rigid uh, bodies. So that's what I'll show you here. Systems of rigid bodies, the Lagrangian formulation. So instead of N particles, let's say we have N rigid bodies. And they'll have a inertial velocity V and an angular velocity of the body frame with respect to the inertial frame, omega, and we'll put subscript J for the jth body. Uh, on each particle, there'll be some non-conservative force and also non-conservative moment, but then there'll be a potential energy. Any, any moment or force that comes from a, a potential energy will just lump into that potential energy function. So we'll have our Lagrangian 
function L will be the sum of the kinetic energy, total kinetic energy of each body. So that means translational plus rotational minus, and there's no summation over U. The, when we talk about the potential energy, it's the total potential energy for the whole system. So this is the potential energy for the system. This is the kinetic energy of each rigid body. And the sum of them is T without any subscript. So this is still just total kinetic energy minus total potential energy. But we now have two types of projection vectors to handle the uh, non-conservative force and non-conservative moment. So for translational, the translational motion projection vector is the same as before. We've been using gamma, J, I. This is partial V, J, partial Q, I, dot. And for the rotational components, I'm gonna use a different symbol, it's beta, J I, but it has a very an analogous form. This is partial the angular velocity, so partial omega J partial Q I dot. And then right, the, the beauty of generalized forces is that it includes both the usual translational forces, but also moments. So now the generalized force, uh, I guess we're talking about the generalized non-conservative force. QI and C equals, now it's still a summation over all of the bodies. This part is the same as before. Non-conservative force dotted with gamma J I, but now we have, we just add plus the non-conservative moment dotted with beta J I. I mean, what these betas do is they project the rotational dynamics into directions in which there are no constraints. So with all this, Lagrange's equations look the same. That's another beauty of it. So for both systems of particles and systems of rigid bodies, Lagrange's equations look the same. I guess I should say they are the same. So it's total derivative, partial L, partial QI dot, minus partial L, partial QI, equals Q, I, and C. I goes from one to little n, the number of generalized coordinates that you use to describe both the um, translational and rotational configuration of your system of rigid bodies. So it's the same. So just like before, this left-hand side, this includes all of the inertial terms related to both translational and rotational motion. Taking these derivatives gets it all right. And over here, these non-conservative forces and moments, they are included correctly. So maybe I'll give you a, uh, an example <clears throat> of what this, what this looks like. Because I, I know that for most of you, this is new. And we're not necessarily gonna look at a system of like tons of rigid bodies. We'll just look at like one rigid body at this point, but 
here's an example. Um, let me get a picture. A rocking cylinder. So if only I had a cylinder, I, I used to have it. I don't know where it is. When my kids were little, they played with wooden blocks. And so one of the wooden blocks was the thing described in this homework problem. And it's just a cylinder. It's, I don't know, it's got a radius of an inch or something, I forget. Um, and the frequency of it, I think it was somewhere between like two and three Hertz, if you get it rocking back and forth. So keep that in mind. Uh, but for a system, like this, this is a rigid body and we can write the kinetic energy and the potential energy. I guess something to say up front is what is the potential energy due to gravity for a rigid body? Um, so this is, the, this is the rocking cylinder. The potential energy due to gravity on a rigid body is uh, it's the mass of the rigid body times gravity times the height, height of the center of mass. So completely analogous to what you, you do for particles. So if there's more than one potential energy, maybe there's like a spring force or something, include that. But in this case, we've got our, our center of mass. I don't know what to use as a reference height. I guess it'd be, maybe you want this height above the ground. So you could calculate that, um, knowing that this is rolling without slipping. The kinetic energy will be the, the kinetic energy of translation plus the kinetic energy of rotation. So if this was, uh, I don't know if we've got X, G, Y, G, the translational kinetic energy would be one half M X, G dot squared plus Y, G dot squared. And then what's the rotational kinetic? It's the rotational kinetic energy for rigid body in 2D. So it'd be one half, um, I G. So the moment of inertia about the center of mass times omega squared. So whatever that angular velocity is. Now I'm not saying for this problem um, that you use X, G and Y, G as generalized coordinates. If you think about this system, how many degrees of freedom does it have? It only has one and it's that angle because as this rolls, as it rolls back and forth, the position of the center of mass is directly tied to that angle. So you can write, you'll write X, G and uh, uh, Y, G in terms of theta and theta dot. And actually you'll write omega as well. So theta is the one degree of freedom here. So you'll get, you'll get something for that. You'll get some kinetic energy. If you wanna know that you're on the right track, I'll give it to you here. It's one half M. If this thing has a radius R, then it's uh, R squared, theta dot squared, three halves minus eight cosine theta over three pi, you're like, oh my goodness, where does that come from? Well, you could figure out where the center of mass is for a cylinder in terms of its radius. And you should get this. So you'd have that for the kinetic energy. And you'll notice this is of the form, it's a kinetic energy that depends on theta and theta dot. So don't forget that if you, were, you use Lagrange's equations. Um, yeah, and at the end of the day, as this thing, given the dimensions that you're told, the frequency of rocking 
is uh, about uh, 2.8 hertz. Okay. Um, what about the other one? Oh yeah, that one's crazy. So here's another example. It's a rigid body in 3D. This, um, I, I think, I mean, I want you to imagine this is some kind of uh, big scary piece of machinery in the machine shop and you want to get away from it because <laughs> it's this whirling, it's a spinning whirling metal thing. I don't want to be anywhere near it once this thing is turned on. Um, so you need to pick a frame for the rigid body. So it kind of makes sense. At least one of these things will be, uh, you know, along the axis of the body. I don't know. I don't know if we're, it doesn't, you're gonna be like, oh, I followed what you did and I got it wrong. You gotta do it right. Okay, B1, B2, let's say. Um, and you could use, you know, the center of mass I, I don't know where the center mass is. You'd have to you have to calculate it somewhere, right? To get the get the potential energy, which is due to gravity. It's going to be mg and then height of center of mass. And maybe you're like height of center of mass with respect to what? With respect to some reference point. In this case, the uh, pivot. Let's call that point O. It's inertially fixed because it's just a, it's a point. It's along the axis of this, this spinning motor thing. So you could use that as your reference point. So you get the height with respect to that. And then it's gonna be Mg minus L cosine theta where L is this dimension here, the distance from L to G. What about for the, and, so here's the nice thing that just writing that potential energy will take care of the moment due to gravity, as well as any kind of translational things due to gravity. It just gets it right for you. Um, what about kinetic energy? So for kinetic energy, we could do like we did up above where it's translation of the center of mass and then rotation with, with respect to the center of mass. But for this, since we know that there's this fixed inertially fixed point on the body, we may as well write the kinetic energy in terms of that inertially fixed point. So what, what does that mean? That's you know one half, we've got omega, the body with respect to the inertial frame, written, uh, we'll take that as a, as a row vector times the moment of inertia matrix of the body with respect to the point O. So maybe I'll just do this, write it that way. And the, this will be some three by three matrix. I'll give you another gift. Here's with that. And you need to find this out by you treat this as a composite body, right? It's a it's this shape plus you know this shape. You you know how to do that. You have experience with that. So what you should get is um, I'm going to pull out a overall ML squared, and this is like twenty over three, one twelfth, and twenty seven four. This is using the way I've written B1, B2, and then coming out of the uh, screen is B3. So this becomes, those, those are principal axes. So that's what we get. And then you can figure out, well, what's omega? I don't know. Because you'll have to write that and it'll be something in terms of theta 
and theta dot, which is our single degree of freedom. So this, you're like, it's moving in 3D. How could it be a single degree of freedom? Well, because we are moving the plane that the T is moving, it, that's just happening due to a motor. So that's not a degree of freedom. The only direction in which this thing can move is this sort of angle theta. And uh, you are told, all right, I crank up omega to a certain value and this thing shoots out. And how far away should I stand if I don't want to get hit by it? Like what? Okay. How do I answer that question? Well, to answer things like that, we need to go to the next topic, just phase space. But before we get to phase space, any questions about Lagrange's equations in this sort of standard form with kinetic and potential energy, all that? No, good. It's crystal clear. It is crystal clear, good. Okay. Well, you'll figure some stuff out as you go through the homework. So now we're gonna talk about phase space, sometimes called state space. So if you've taken a class in controls, I think they use the term state space. This is just the, it's, it's, it's more of a mathematical thing that describes uh, how once you've got your system of ordinary differential equations, what are the trajectories in the space of the Q's and the Q dots? So I think uh, it's good to just think first of a one degree of freedom system with uh, x as the coordinate the variable then if we have m x double dot is capital f of you know a force that's a function of x and x dot this is a second order ode And we want to put this into first order form. So we define y. We say y is equal to x dot. It's just defined as being x dot. And then this equation looks like y dot equals, um, we'll say f, little f, x, y, where little f, x, y is equal to, it's defined as just this big f, x, and you're like, why is it y? Because we defined x dot to be y, so divided by m. So our two first order ODEs are, uh, we've got X dot equals Y, Y dot equals F of X, Y, which depends on what type of force we've got. And now you look at this and you, you can think of this, this is kind of the big leap, I guess. Think of this as describing a two-dimensional fluid. So we have a two-dimensional fluid and these ODEs describe how if you were to drop a particle into this fluid, how it would move. Because mathematically, this is a two-dimensional velocity field 
Wait, what? What is that? Let me show you. Um, so this is what phase space is. X and Y are the coordinates of phase space. Phase space. So let's plot, um, let's put some coordinates X and Y. So what this is telling us is that at any given point, let's say at this point, we can draw a vector where the X component of the vector is proportional to Y. So let's just say it's, uh, it's X dot equals Y. And the Y component of the vector is uh, equal to whatever this function f of x and y is, and I'm just drawing it going down. And so we've got a, a vector at each point. So you know, if I pick some other point, let's say I pick points on the x-axis. Um, points on the x-axis are special because x dot equals the y component there. The y component there is zero. So these are vectors that are either pointing straight up or straight down. They're perpendicular to the x-axis. Typically for uh, physical problems, you're gonna be pointing down. And oops, and it'll get smaller and smaller as we get to this origin, let's say. And then over here on the opposite side, it'll be going up, getting further up as you go further away. Um, and I, this is just for some particular choice of F. I don't know what it'll be for any given problem, but I'm just giving you an idea. And you know, at other points that aren't on, oops, on, aren't on an axis, it'll be, you'll get vectors that are at some angle. So you can imagine a field of vectors Okay, and it's if you've taken a fluids course, maybe you've seen fluids written as you know x dot equals u x and y, right? It's where we say u is the x component of the fluid velocity, and y dot equals v x and y. That's the y component of the velocity. <clears throat> so it is literally, you know, looks like a fluid. It looks like a fluid vector field. And we could treat it the same way. Like I said, you could drop things in here. What's dropping things? And that means you start with some initial condition and initial conditions must instantaneously always follow the path. So if I start at this point as an initial condition, instantaneously my path must always be tangent to the vectors. So maybe I follow that and you know I get to here. Wherever it goes, it's going to be tangent to a vector and so on. Okay. So if, if this is my you know time t equals zero, then this is some um, t equals t1. So I followed how it moves. So if you, you can look at um, uh, something that's called the phase portrait. The phase portrait is a, when people use this term, it's a representative collection of trajectories, which you could think of as solutions to your ODE. It's a collection of trajectories that reveal the main features. Like, what do you mean features? I'll okay, I'll show you. Um, they also highlight periodic orbits um, and equilibrium points. Equilibrium points are where the vector field goes to zero. So the arrow shrinks to nothing. Got a point. 
So there's equilibrium points and there's periodic orbits. Periodic orbits are where if you start with an initial condition, you actually come back to that same in initial condition. Right? So we'll, you might be asking, well, what else could happen? Well, you could spiral into some stable equilibrium point or you could drift off and go off to infinity. So let's look at an example system, the pendulum, okay? The pendulum is nice. So the pendulum ODE, we've written it a few times, theta double dot equals negative G over L cosine theta. That's in the second order form. When we turn it into first order form, I'll define theta dot as omega and then omega dot is theta double dot, that's negative G over L cosine theta. So now I've chosen, um, instead of X and Y, I'm writing it in terms of theta and omega, okay? But it's the same thing. And we could write the, the vector field for this. Let me show theta and omega. I'll just give some representative ones. There's, um, if we don't have any friction, we expect pendulum, you release from some initial condition, it'll keep going back and forth, doing something periodic forever, right? So if I started with some, initial condition, let's say I release at this angle theta, then initially the angle will decrease, uh, go to zero and then come back up and so on. So this will be periodic. Let's say I released at a larger angle. Well, that means this, um, this vector is actually larger here. It'll pass through some intermediate points and then come back. So if I release from this angle, first decrease and then reach a point. Let me sketch, what do I, what do I mean um, at various points? I think that would, that would be helpful. So this is me, if I were to plot a little sketch, this is the pendulum bob at its largest angle, but it's it's turning that way. It wants to fall toward negative angles. And then at this point, what do I have? I've got the pendulum, it's well on its way. And at this point, what do I have? The pendulum is actually passing through the bottom and it's got its top speed in the negative direction. So it's good to have these sort of, um, you've got the phase space, but then you have the physical interpretation as well. And this will go and come back. Right, and we could plot other pictures, oops, of what the, these different segments are. Like what's happening here. It's, it's actually past the bottom point. It's up here and it's going to the left still. Um, what about there? It's now heading back to the to the right. Up here, at this top point, it's passing again through theta equals zero, but it's got its top speed going to the right. And then this whole cycle continues. I've got a, I think a handy dandy little video shows this. So this is actually showing more than I just showed. This is for a really large angle, but you can see theta and theta dot. Um, and I'll post this, you can stare at it and wonder, okay? 
So what's going on here? I want a little bit more room. No, it's all right. Let me insert a file. Yeah, this is cool. I like this one. So this is just showing, what I was showing in my little sketch was kind of close to the uh, origin. So close to the downward position. If you include more positions, you get this thing over here on the right. So we've got, there are equilibrium points. If I were to plot them, there is a, okay, there's an equilibrium point at the origin. So that means you start in the downward position with no motion, nothing happens. And then of course, there's this inverted position, which is unstable. Um, and you could think of those as happening at uh, plus or minus. If we're using radians to measure the angle here, this is at pi and negative pi. But of course, those are physically the same. So what's going on here? We have in this, in, if we're really close to the downward position, if we release anything, it's just going to swing back and forth. So this is this would be a this is a phase portrait over here. This is revealing the main features. Um, in fact, everything in this yellow region is just going to oscillate back and forth without going over the top position. I'll sketch in blue everything that goes over the top position. This is going over the top position to the right, and this is going over the top position to the left down here. So these are some main features, different qualitative uh, types of motion. There's sort of just oscillating back and forth, and then there's this, whoa, complete rotation. It'll slow down near the top point, but it'll still keep making it. And then there are these special um, trajectories. I'll just highlight them here. This would be like if you start at the upward position and you just barely give it a tap, it'll it'll go down and then come back up, barely coming back to the top position. And you could do that in two directions, right? Hit it to the left or hit it to the right. And so these two are called, um, they're special trajectories. We call them a separatrix because they separate two qualitatively different types of motion. Um, so. These are all, this is a, the pendulum is a one degree of freedom system. If you have a one degree of freedom system, that means you have a two dimensional phase space. So that means you can, you can plot it. If you have a two degree of freedom system, well then for each of your degrees of freedom, you have a velocity. So this jumps up to four dimensions and then it's harder to plot can't easily visualize that, but you can still determine things about it. I mean, what about n dimensions? I mean, n degrees of freedom. If I have n degrees of freedom, then I have a 2n dimensional phase space. So it's always double the number of degrees of freedom. And there, are, we're not going to get into it in this class, but there are techniques to look at to n um, whatever degrees of freedom you want. There are even, there's computational tools um, for plotting this. There used to be a really good one for MATLAB. Now there's one that's not so good, but there's also an online phase portrait plotter. So I don't know if you can see this. Um, I'm gonna plot for the, um, this is really hard to see here. So I'm plotting, I'll plot the phase portrait for the pendulum. And we'll just say that G over L, we've chosen the units. Now, nah, I guess I'll do it. So you don't freak out. Um, negative 9.8 divided by one times, uh, I'll just say I have a pendulum that's uh, length one meter or something, times what, cosine, or is it sine? We got sine of x, x. So hopefully it accepts that. 
Um, this just gives the bounds of what it's plotting. I'll go from about negative pi to pi. And then I don't really care what those other two are. And graph phase plane. Whoa, look at that. That's cool. So this shows me the phase plane. I can just sort of push my finger on there and it's it's plotting what those initial conditions do. So we might actually want to make this, um, maybe I'll make it go from plus 15 and neg negative 15 and then graph again. And then you could see from these red lines, it's kind of filling out that phase space I was showing. I chose variable length arrows. If I didn't want that, then it'll just do kind of all, all the arrows look the same, but it doesn't tell you like relative speeds, but then it's easier to see these things. So if I were to ask you for a phase portrait plotted numerically, you can use this tool and I will even post it in the chat. Um, if I can figure that out. Yeah, uh, there it is. So this is, this is the page I'm on. It seems to work at least on Mac computers. I don't know about PCs. Um, I'll also post a MATLAB, some MATLAB code that creates phase portraits. Um, and those are useful. How do we, how would we use this? I don't know. Um, sometimes to answer questions related to physical phenomena, you do need to know. Um, so like that one problem, it's in the homework where there's a tube, some angle, and this is you know, rotating around. And there's a there's a bead in this tube. And you're you're you know you're told what the um, what to get for the equation of motion here. But then you just need to put it into a first order form. Um, right for this thing got, we just have one generalized coordinate, it's, it's R, and R double dot minus three fourths R omega squared plus G over two equals zero is what you're supposed to get. And then you're asked to non-dimensionalize this. So if you haven't ever non-dimensionalized um, you can, in this case, we could use the, um, we could use a characteristic length scale. So that means we've got, we've got G and we've got Omega are kind of parameters to deal with. We know that the dimensions of G are it's um, meters per second squared. Those are the units. What are the dimensions of the rotation? It's just one over seconds. So we want to write a non-dimensional um, variable x, which means take r and divide it by some length scale l. So some combination of G and Omega will give you a length scale. If you're like, okay, well, I see that there's a uh, meters in G. So what if I did G divided by Omega squared? Well, that's a length scale. And then you need to have a non-dimensional time. So what would that be? You got to get time out of here. You could get time from just one over omega. 
So that's a characteristic um, time scale. Then, uh, oh, I guess this isn't a non-dimensional time. Sorry, this is a, this is, the non-dimensional time would be, let's call it tau. And it's T divided by some characteristic length scale. The characteristic length scale is one over omega because that's all you got to work with. So if you choose those, um, then we want to rewrite, right? What is this up here? R double dot is second derivative of R with respect to T minus three fourths R omega squared plus G over two equals zero. Now write this in terms of the non-dimensional variable and the non-dimensional time. So this would give you, if you do this, you'll get L over T squared, second derivative of X with respect to the non-dimensional time minus three fourths. Um, right, we're writing everything in terms of our new non-dimensional variable and our non-dimensional time. XL omega squared plus uh, G over two equals zero. And now if we divide um, or just think of it as multiply by um, one over we'll multiply by one over L omega squared, then what do we get? We get one over omega squared T squared, three fourths, ooh, X, that's nice, plus G over two L omega squared equals zero. And so what does this give us, given how we've defined L, this thing becomes just one half. And this become, this is just one. So once we've non-dimensionalized, this looks pretty simple. And you could write this as a, um, in first order form. So this is the second order ODE, but it's non-dimensionalized. Now, if you put it in first order form, we can define, uh, uh, let's say, I like using over dots, let's use a big over circle. So over circle of something means the derivative with respect to tau of that something. So let's define y is x over circle. Then uh, in first order form, first order form, this is x over dot is y, y over dot is um, three fourths x minus one half. So what if we just, what if we plotted that? Let's go to phase portrait plotter. We've got, it calls it X prime, X prime. That's the, that's the same, it was Y. And then what was this? Three divided by four times X minus one half. This, these things don't really matter. Um, well, I guess it does matter. X represents a distance and R is only positive. So there's no negative R. So we can go from zero to, I don't know, something five. And then this goes negative. Let's just make it kind of a square domain, negative 2.5 to five or 2.5. 
I do want to show variable arrows. There we go. This is the face. Well, this is not the face portrait yet because I don't have any representative trajectories. This is just a vector field. Now, if I just start picking some initial conditions, you know, oh, something special is going on. It looks like there's an equilibrium point. Also, somewhere out here for some value of x, that's the end of the tube. So if you're asked, all right, where would I want to release this? Uh, at the base of the tube with the minimum energy to make this thing escape out of the tube. Well, it's somewhere up here. Some tra special trajectory will just barely avoid getting to that equilibrium point and then will shoot out of the tube. So you could think about that. And it's even, it's something that you can calculate, right? What did we just get there in that uh, phase portrait X? This is X dot. Um, there's some trajectory. It's, it's, it's like a separatrix. And we can even put arrows on it. So there are some things, if you start near the base of the tube, you'll just sort of come back and hit the tube again. Uh, some things start out far away and they come in a little bit and then leave, right? Somewhere over here is the, the end of the tube. And so if you get shot out of the end of the tube, it's like this phase portrait, um, our model must change. And then there's some special things that um, they, they will go out. So the phase portrait reveals all the different types of behavior, even for this, what seems like a relatively simple system. There's qualitatively different things. And there's some minimum velocity you need that if you go there, then you will shoot out of the tube. You could also view this in terms of a potential energy. Um, and you could do the potential energy either in X or in R. Um, why is that? Let me just sort of end here. This will be brief. If you've got some function, X double dot is a function of just X, not X dot only a function of position, not velocity. If you have that for any second order ODE, then you can always write f of x. And this is just in one degree of freedom, by the way, not more than one. You can always write f of x in as the negative derivative of, we'll say, an effective potential. Where you get that effective potential by just taking the negative of the integral, the indefinite integral of x, because the constant doesn't matter. So you take the negative indefinite in integral of f, then this could be written as x double dot is negative derivative of an effective potential. And then that simplifies things because as a one degree of freedom problem, all we would need is a plot of what the effective potential looks like. So if our effective potential looked um, something like this, where it's got a peak in the middle, we can right below that plot what the, um, we could sketch what the phase portrait will look like. Whenever we have a slope of an, a, a potential energy is zero, that's an equilibrium point. And if we're at the, a peak of energy, then that's not a stable point. A stable point is at the bottom of a well. Here we're at the top of a hill. 
which means that locally trajectories are uh, look like a saddle, looks like a saddle point. So you could actually sketch um, what's going on. So you've got a saddle point. This is just qualitative sketch. And then all other trajectories, you know, can't pass through other things. So you get an idea of what the dynamics would look like just from the shape of the potential energy. And maybe we'll say more about that um, next time. But another good thing about this is given an initial condition, there's an effective energy that's conserved. It's one half x dot squared, no, no mass, one half x dot squared plus u effective. This effective energy is constant along trajectories or is a constant of motion. Meaning along each of these paths here, each of these trajectories, this value E effective is a, a constant. And whenever you have constants of motion that becomes helpful. All right, that is it for today.